Hi, everyone. Hello again. In Adel Safra's book, The Divine Unity of Scripture, we have reached chapter 12, our faith based on facts, and the Bible, a book of facts. There are two points which I wish to bring before you this morning. These are lectures you might pick up. That the scripture history supplies us with the facts and principles upon which all true philosophical and universal history is based. And the second point is this, that the history recorded in the books of Moses and of the other writers of the ancient dispensation contains actual and real history. In my last lecture, I endeavored to show why it is that we cannot understand Moses and the prophets without the apostolic light of the gospels and epistles. And to this I wish only to add one remark. Nothing can be said in stronger terms concerning the evangelical history of the ancient scriptures than the simple remark which the Apostle Paul made to Timothy, that the scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And although there are many things, both in the ancient history and in the ancient prophecy, which will fully be explained and manifested only at the second coming of our blessed Savior, Still, as we are told both by the Apostle Paul and by the Apostle Peter, the whole Old Testament was written in order that it may be understood by the Church of Jesus Christ, who live in the latter days, and unto whom there has been granted the privilege of seeing the fulfillment of God's promise. For so the Apostle Peter says with regard to prophecy, that through suffering the Messiah should enter into that glory, that it was revealed to the prophets, that not to themselves but to us, they did testify of these things. And of the ancient history, the Apostle Paul declares in his epistle to the Romans that all these things happened for our example and were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. By the way, I think it's actually quoting from Corinthians here, not Romans. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to forgive Adolf Saffer for a, a slip, Didn't, which apparently yeah. got into the notes because of the lectures. This is his last book, right? And I didn't you so. say that it's probably not a corrected? Because it leaves in stuff that you probably would have taken out if you're re writing a book like this morning. Yeah. When we we're doing the lectures. Okay. Seeing, therefore, that we have the fullness of the gospel light, that there have been manifested to us these histories. It is for us to enter into the consideration of Moses and the prophets in the full assurance and expectation that the Holy Ghost has there treasured up for us all that is profitable and needful for our instruction and guidance in connection with that fuller development of history and teaching which we now possess. A combination of history, teaching, prophecy, with the subjective response of the congregation, both in works of reflection and in the lyrical outpourings of their feelings, is something to, altogether unique, and it is a combination which corresponds to all the different wants and necessities of mankind as they arise in the course of centuries. While it corresponds with our need, it is the only kind of book of revelation worthy of him from whom it emanates. Ideas without facts make up a philosophy. Facts without ideas make up a history. But that which we need is something which appeals not merely to our intellect, but also to our conscience and to our heart and that which so appeals must be the revelation of God. And if it is the revelation of God, it can only be the revelation of God coming down out of his infinite eternity into our time and into our space. It must record the initiative, creative, and redemptive acts of the Most High. And in recording these acts, it must contain a revelation of his character and of his purpose, of his commandments concerning us, and of the promises by which he sustains us. And only in Scripture have we such a combination. All Scripture facts are full of ideas, so to speak that they are full of eyes, and light shines to us in them. And all Scripture ideas, the things which we believe and the things which we hope for, are based upon actual facts, manifestations of the Most High. If a Christian is asked, what is your belief, what is your faith, he does not answer by enumerating dogmas, 
in the sense of abstract philosophical truths. But he answers by saying that he believes in God who created, in God who became incarnate and died and rose again, and in God who sent the Holy Ghost to renew his heart. So what is our creed but facts? But such facts are full of light and in, and in which God manifests himself to us. Hmm. Again, the name of God and that name which we should not know without the Bible, is Jehovah. And Jehovah has this meaning. First, that he is sovereign, self-subsisting and eternal. But secondly, that he has become the God of history and is in history. And thirdly, that he is the God who is coming, who is fulfilling his promises and who will consummate all the counsel which was in him in eternity. And as this simple name, Jehovah, contains all scripture history, all scripture teaching, and all scripture prophecy, so the people who accept this name, Jehovah, live in the past, and in the present, and in the future. To live merely in the past by memory is a kind of death, in which there is no activity, but simply regret. To live merely in the present without remembering the past and looking forward to the future is unworthy of man who is created in the image of God. To think merely of the future is simply a work of imagination and reverie. But past, present, and future, Jehovah who was, Jehovah who is, and Jehovah who is to come, this is what fills up the whole of man. He lives by memory. He lives by present uh, communion. He lives by hope. And all the saints of God, from Enoch, the seventh from Adam, until those who shall be alive at Christ's coming, remember the merciful deeds of God in the past, live in communion with the present living God, and look forward to the glorious consummation of God's purposes. So all scripture must be viewed in the light of history. And in this history, teaching, prophecy, and the response of the congregation are comprehended. He seems to be thinking of this text in Revelation. Uh, this is Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And then the very next verse, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, mm -hmm. is, was, and is to come. Mm -hmm. This seems to be a riff on that famous passage in Exodus, where we're told that God told Moses to go back and say to Pharaoh and his people, when they ask, who, what is his name? Yeah. Say that I am has sent me to you. And then mm -hmm. his being the name seems to be wrapped up with his his eternal being yes but also his purpose in the future mm -hmm. in respect to israel he'll this, be what he has to be he will be what wants he to be. wants to be to his mm -hmm. own people yeah so right. a lot of christians of course take verse seven of course that's all i think even the witnesses would take that as a reference to christ but they don't believe it right every eye will see him they yeah. think that's symbolic mm -hmm. but the very next verse most christians in my experience, take as also a reference to Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Because of the coming, probably. Be and in the Old Testament, though, the coming is is the day of the Lord. Yes. It's Jehovah coming. Yeah. And But we know from the, the New Testament, it's talking about the second coming of Christ. Well, in the Old Testament, it seems to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's Yahweh himself coming mm. and being seen. And mm -hmm. some other times it's the Son of Man or the Messiah coming. Yeah. And that's the mystery that needs to be cleared up in the New Testament. Yeah. Mm. The Bible is a book separate from all other books and high above all other books. That is quite true. On the other hand, the Bible is connected with all other books in the world. And as all things must work together for good to them that love God, so all books that are written, even those that are written against the Bible, contribute to the corroboration and to the illustration of the scriptures. Joseph was considered a dreamer and very ambitious, and yet, after all, his dream was fulfilled. 
that all the sheaves of his brethren did obeisance before his sheaf. And thus it is that all the books that have ever been written, ever were written, on whatever subject, must contribute to show forth that Scripture is the book of books. As a French socialist who had no faith in Scripture has said, it is a strange thing that we cannot think on any subject, but in a few minutes we come to theology. Yeah, it is a strange thing. We'll put in a link to the series we did. I believe it's five videos altogether, the first of which, and all of them really, are on the theme of the various divine names revealed, primarily in Genesis, but obviously God the Father, the, the final name revealed in the New Testament in its glory. Mm. See you soon. Yes. Bye.